Jibhim and uh, Namo Buddhai to all of you. Today, uh, we are nearing the end of uh, book three, which we have been studying for some time now. And uh, uh, this book three, as we have seen, is uh, a very concise statement of Baba Sahib Ambedkar on what is Dhamma, what is Adhamma, and what is Sadhamma. And here in this class, we are going to look at very interesting sort of uh, subsections that we have been uh, studying as a part of uh, uh, section four that has been inscribed here in the Buddhani Dhamma. And we have already covered the subsection one, and today we are going to look at the subsection two and subsection three. So the subsection uh, two is titled as Dhamma to be Sadhamma must teach that worth and not birth is the measure of man. So, you know, there, there is always a talk of how do we measure the man? How do we know that somebody is living uh, his humanity fully? How do, you, how do we even know that people are living the life of uh, a man or human being? And a very famous poet from Mahashta says that, you know, um, um, a human being, when are you going to become a human being? So the same question applies to us, you know, what makes us a human being? So uh, whether our birth in a particular class, whether our birth in a particular caste, or whether our birth in, in a particular gender, or whether our birth in a particular nation or a particular culture, what does it that determines the, the major of man? And here Baba Sambedkar has given a very succinct sort of a title, Dhamma to be Sadhamma must teach that worth and not birth is the measure of man. And this sentence is very interesting because uh, if we look at the caste ridden society, uh, that of like that of India, where we find that the people are discriminated based on their birth and not uh, based on who they really are as human beings. And I think who we really are determines uh, our, our humanness, our, 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 our claim to be a human being. So, you know, the Buddha, as we have seen in the, in, the, in, the, in the previous classes also, that the Buddha taught about the five precepts as the standard by which we can choose uh, what we are doing. And uh, therefore, uh, I think this, this, this is... Uh, this subsection uh, is going to be one of the uh, important pieces in the Buddhism as to how or what makes us a human being. So as we have, we have seen, uh, Baba Sambedkar has gone into a little depth about the theory of Chaturvarna and it was preached by the Brahmins and it was based on birth. So one is a Brahmin because he's born of a Brahmin parents. One is a Kshatriya because he's born of Kshatriya parents. One is a Vaishya because one is born of Vaishya parents. And one is Shudra because one is born of Shudra parents. So worth of a man, according to the Brahmins, was based on birth and on nothing else. And that is what has been the case with the caste system. You know, you are, uh, this according to the Brahminical Hinduism, where you are born, in particular class or caste that determines who you are. And according to that, you know, your name is decided and you know, every, everything is decided. Your economic status is decided and, 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 and it gives rise to a society that doesn't let human beings to really develop into who they can be. So let's look at this, the Buddha's doctrine. What was the Buddha's doctrine? And Baba Sambedkar encapsulated it very well. He says that, his doctrine was just the opposite of the doctrine of the Brahmins. So the Buddha's doctrine was completely opposed to the doctrine of the Brahmins. It was his doctrine that worth and not birth was the measure of man. So, you know, where you are born, which class of people, uh, you know, a, a particular person is born or which country or which linguistic background or which gender they are born is, is of no consequence. What is important is your worth. And how do you determine your worth? That's going to be the part of the discussion that will ensue just now. So uh, Baba Sahib uh, cites a very important sutta in Buddhism called Vasala Sutta. 
uh, wasallam means an outcast so outcast we don't have to uh, take it as an untouchable or 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 you know like that because in every society the society treats uh, you know people very badly and um, you know they 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 try to shun the contact with them and they try to claim that these people are 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 are, are lowly so here the occasion on which the buddha propounded his doctrine has its own peculiar interest so let's see how baba sahib ambedkar studies the sutra also because you know he is not just uh, going after the content of the sutta but he is also looking at what is called the context or the occasion of the sutta so once the blessed one the buddha was staying in anatha pindika's ashram one day in the forenoon he took his begging bowl and entered shravasti for alms so this setting is in in, in shravasti and the buddha enters the city of shravasti for alms at that time a sacrificial pyre was burning and an offering was prepared then the blessed one going for alms from house to house in shravasti approached the house of the brahmin agdika so we know that the buddha had a custom for, to go from house to house to for his for his begging rounds and uh, this was the occasion when the buddha was wandering for his uh, begging round in the city of shravasti and he happened to go to the house of brahmin agdika the brahmin seeing the blessed one coming at a distance became angry and said stay there o shivling so the the buddha look looking at the buddha the uh, 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 brahmin agdika said that o shivling just stay there there stay ye wretched monk stay there a, rich, a, a miserable outcast you see that's how the brahmin arrogant brahmins used to uh, you know address the buddha as as a wretched man or as a miserable outcast you see the the even that time you know the even the brahmin the brahmanism was not that prominent at that time in that part of country even the the, the arrogant brahmins used to address the the great buddha the, the the best among the human beings the best of the man as 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 a a, a shivling as as a, a wretched monk and as a miserable outcast so they actually call buddha the outcast wassala then he spoke thus the blessed one addressed him as follows do you know o brahmin who an outcast is or the things that make a person an outcast so the buddha you know we have seen the style of the buddha's teaching you know he will, he will never get angry he will respond with his uh, poise he will re- respond with his tranquility he will respond with 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 very deep and unfathomable compassion in his heart so that's how the buddha responded the buddha said do you know o brahmin who an outcast is or the things that make a person an outcast so that is what the buddha buddha said so uh, you know the, the agika uh, brahmin agika answered no gotama i do not know who an outcast is nor indeed do i know what things make a man an outcast so this is the approach of the brahmins to the buddha they used to call him by the first name gotama as you know and and a shivling or an outcast and so on and so forth so the lord pleaded that nothing would be lost in knowing who is an outcast now that you insist on my knowing it the brahmin agika said well go on and explain you see how this arrogant brahmins have been you know asking the buddha oh, well go on and now explain me what is this business of an outcast so this is what the buddha responded and i think this response of the buddha is very interesting very important for us to understand the man who is irritable now these are the qualities of a person and we have to we have this this measure of man okay as the title of this subsection suggests the man who is irritable rancorous vicious detractive perverted in views and deceitful you see all these adjectives that that the buddha has thrown here about about who is an outcast the person the man who is irritable rancorous vicious detractive perverted in views and deceitful know that he is an outcast so that's the definition of an outcast one definition of an outcast 
So you see that it doesn't matter where you're born, well, you know, which class of people you're born, which country you're born, which uh, linguistic background uh, one is born or which gender one is born. It doesn't matter what matters is, you know, what matters you an outcast, what makes you an outcast or what, you know, um, what can be the measure of a man is this that the person who is very irritable, rancorous, vicious, detractive, perverted in views and deceitful, no way that he is an outcast. 15. Whosoever in this world harms living being, beings once born or twice born, in whom there is no compassion for living beings, no way that he is an outcast. The verse number 15, you know, is even if you take it, if you take it as one verse that can decide the measure of a man, this can be the verse. And you apply this measure to the so-called Brahmins or so-called people who are supremacists, who try to claim that they are superior based on, you know, the, their location of birth. If you, if you, if you, if you, if we understand even this one sort of the Gatha, the Gatha number 15, whosoever in this world harms living beings once born, or toys born, in whom there is no compassion for living beings, no way that he is an outcast. You see, to become a human being, to become, to qualify you and to be called a human being, it's very important, according to Buddha, to have the compassion for living beings. If we are harming people you know, constantly, if we, whether they are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are human beings or animals or all, anything that is, that is living there, According to the Buddha, the person who harms is an outcast. You know, the person without, without compassion in his heart is an outcast, is a vassal. Whosoever destroys and besieges villages and hamlets and is known as an oppressor, know a, that he is an outcast. A very profound sort of a, of a definition of who can be called outcast. And we can, we can apply this verse number 16 to present day India. We know that there are people who destroys and besieges villages and hamlets and, and, and they burn, they set afire the, the houses of the people in the name of religion, in the name of their, their so-called supremacy or superiority. And we know that they are definitely the outcasts. They are definitely vassals. 17, whether in the village or in the forest, whosoever appropriates by theft what belongs to others or what is not given, no way that he is an outcast. Okay, so uh, a person who steals, a person who, 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 who uh, as you know, we can say that, uh, you know, they take what is not given to them, they are also called the outcasts. Whosoever having really taken a debt, flees when pressed saying there is no debt to you, no way that he is an outcast. In other words, the person who resort to the corruption or the person who resort to claiming something you know, which has been given to them as not given to them. Uh, and and, and we, 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 we see in this verse number uh, 18, whosoever having really taken a debt flees when pressed saying there is no debt to you, no way that he is an outcast. And we can apply this all criteria or all these measures even today because they are not something outdated. We can, we can, we can consider each of them you know, uh, in, in relationship with what is happening in India today or any other part of the world. Who, whosoever desiring some trifle kills a man going alone, alone on the road and pillages him, know a, that he is an outcast. Whosoever for his own sake or, the, or for the sake of others or for the sake of wealth utters lies when asked as a witness, know a, that he is an outcast. You see, the Buddha has forbidden even uh, not to utter a lie when giving a witness. So, uh, you know, we, we have seen in the world that there are many people who stand as a witness, but they tell blatant lies. And that has been considered to be a great violation of the, of the ethical precepts. And uh, definitely the person who is asked to give a witness gives a false evidence is an outcast. Whosoever by force or with consent is seen transgressing with the wives of relatives or friends, know ye that he is an outcast. So you see, the person who is a threat to the 
to the families is a, is a threat you know claiming that they are good friends but they they they, they violate the women of their 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 relatives or friends you know and the buddha said whosoever by force or with consent is seen transgressing with the wives of relatives or friends know that he is an outcast you see very very profound sort of uh, a verse uh, this uh, 21 is and the verse number 22 goes like this whosoever being rich does not support aged mother and father who have passed their youth know a that he is an outcast you see the verse number 22 is also very clear and very very precise verse number 23 goes like this whosoever when questioned about what is good counsels what is wrong and teaches in a counseling way know a that he is an outcast and the Buddha has, if we enumerate the qualities of, 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 of who is an outcast based on the measures suggested by the Buddha here, we can still apply them today to know, you know, the measure of a man, to know their worth and their worth determines their, the, the, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, determines their, their uh, worth, you know, their, not their birth. So their qualities, what are their qualities? The Buddha has very clearly laid out the qualities of the people or the person who can be qualified as what we can say the, uh, uh, what we can say the outcast. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So you see this, 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 uh, this section is of a very profound, profound uh, nature because, you know, in this, we can, we can also see the opposite of it. The person who is not irritable, rancorous, vicious, detractive, you know, clear in views and not deceitful. They are definitely the worthy people. The people who are full of compassion, they don't harm anybody, living beings. They can be called the worthy human beings. The people who, who never destroys or besieges village, but the, they protect the villages and the hamlets. They are the, they are the, you know, what did we call the human beings? You see, so looking at this uh, sutta that, that the Buddha uh, has spoken in response to the arrogance of the Brahmin Agika in, in Buddhism, in, in the Buddhist context, this is very famous as Vassala Sutta. And often you see people reciting this Sutta whenever they talk about how Buddha was opposed to any form of discrimination. And the Buddha, Buddha, Buddha determined the worth of the man by their Kamma. Uh, and, and this is very, very profound. Uh, and the Buddha says, Na jaccha kammuna hoti, na jaccha hoti brahmuna. Kammuna vassala hoti, kammuna hoti brahmuna. So it is your actions in the world, your actions by your body, speech, and mind based on the five precepts, the ethical foundation, Shila, determines, you know, your, your worth. So the Kamma, even in this context, you, we, we don't take the Kamma in this context as something going from this birth to that birth, but Kamma in terms of the action, the intention in the world. And the Buddha says elsewhere, Kammuna Vattati Loko, because of the Kamma, of the human being, the world revolves. We see all around us, it's all human karma. It's all human karma, it's all human action by body, speech, and mind that has that 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 keeps the world going. At least the world of human beings keeps going. So what's profound here is to understand that the Buddha has given very clear, very concise criteria to know the worth of man. And if we apply this criteria to the Brahmins, to Agika, who is trying to go for the sacrificial fire, who is so arrogant of his, of his caste pride, we can see that in reality, he is not a Brahmin at all. He is an outcast. He is even not qualified to be a human being if we treat yourself as superior to somebody. And the Buddha said that you are not superior to others or you are not inferior to anybody. You are not even equal to others. What you are is really who you are with the infinite possibilities that, that you have, the potentialities that, that one can have. And, 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 and it takes some efforts to determine that, that, that what is called the 
development of the potential of 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 each human being and that that has been a very precise theme in the baba sahib's writings and speeches to cultivate the mind to culture the mind and to go beyond our present day capacities so when we look at uh, this uh, particular um, uh, subsection 2 it has become very clear as to what the buddha qualifies the human beings based on the criteria that has been enumerated in the vassala sutta so um, i think well, what we can do we can go on to the next section and then we can have the discussion on on both of them both of the subsections now after completing the subsection 2 so the uh, subsection 3 is titled as dhamma to be sadhamma must promote equality between man and man you see uh, this has not been spoken so uh, clearly by 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 a lot of a uh, uh, lot of uh, people one minute sorry about that so uh, the 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 subsection 3 dhamma to be sadhamma must promote equality between man and man so the question of equality comes very often in 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 buddha's teachings and we have seen that buddha historically might be the first sort of a person to discover that there is a fundamental equality between the human beings and we have seen in the first subsection as to what the buddha has has said identify yourself with others as they so i as i so they so said the buddha as we have seen in the in the first sec- subsection of this section so the theme is very interesting and what i'm going to do is i'm going to read out each verse and then gloss over each of the verses in this particular subsection so baba sahib ambedkar starts with the verse number 1 men are born unequal you see this this statement is very interesting we have to we have to understand this statement unequal doesn't mean because you know you see two human beings are so different that you know all the people cannot be judged based on a single criteria there are many criteria by which we can know you know they you know we can compare people so there is as we can say that there is no single comparative standard to compare between the two human beings you know their professions are different they are born in a different context their bodies are different their 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 physical features are different and what not isn't it so baba sahib ambedkar starts with a proposition called uh, you know in in verse number 1 men are born unequal now this 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 statement you know is a general statement it has nothing to do with caste race gender or whatever it's a general sort of a statement it's a general state of the world that the human beings are born unequal now this is how baba sahib ambedkar goes on qualifying it some are robust others are weaklings some have more intelligence others have less or none some have more capacity others have less some are well to do others are poor all have to enter into what is called the struggle for existence see we all have to struggle for our existence to get our uh, you know bread and butter to get to get shelter and to get the requisites of the life to get our medicines to get a uh, proper health care we all have to struggle so all have to enter into what is called the struggle for existence in the struggle for existence if inequality be recognized as the rule of the game the weakest will always go to the wall very beautifully explained by baba sahib ambedkar here in the struggle for existence if inequality be recognized as the rule of the game you see very very beautifully put whatever we see in the world is determined by the human beings they set up the rules for example the constitution is a set of rule you know that determines our political our social our economic behavior it poses certain limits to it. it it gives us certain liberties but still it is it is the rule it's a grand rule it's a grand law as to how a country will be ruled so you see in the struggle for existence if inequality be recognized as a rule of the game the weakest will always 
go to the wall. It will be the weakest who will suffer the most. That's what Baba Sambhita is saying here. Should this rule of inequality be allowed to be the rule of life? So can we make this rule of inequality to become the rule of life? Some answer in the affirmative on the ground that it results in the survival of the fittest. See, this is the logical sort of uh, building up that Baba Sambedkar does. And we have to understand this logic very beautifully. It was very analytically and logically explained by, by, by Baba Sambedkar here. So what does he say? Some answer in the affirmative on the ground that it results in the survival of the fittest. The question, however, is, is the fittest the best from the point of view of society? So do, do, at what cost we allow the so-called fittest to survive at the cost of the society? If the fit is, is you know, capable of destroying the society, are we going to allow that, uh, that fit person? You know? So the question is, is the fittest the best from the point of view of society? So from the point of view of the society, there are contending views, whether we want the person who are fit or we want the best people or we want the good people. We want the people who, who help people to sustain their lives, who help people to grow in their lives. No one can give a positive answer. See this, this legal mind of Baba Sambedkar working here. The clarity that he brings to the issues is very profound. You know, the inequality cannot be the rule of, of, of life. Though we, everybody's, even among the Brahmin classes, so-called caste, they claim that we are superior. Even among them, no two Brahmins are the same. They cannot be the same. Some people are, some of, some, some of them may be robust, some of them may be very mean-minded, some of them may be good, whatever. But no two human beings are ever same. They cannot be the same, you know. The, no two DNAs can match. It's not possible for two DNAs to match to a T. So that is what is what Baba Sambedkar called the human beings are born unequal. So you see, it's very deep sort of analysis that Baba Sambedkar has come up with. He says that, is the fittest the best from the point of view of society? No one can give a positive answer. It is because of this doubt that religion preaches equality. And that's why the religion has to preach equality. Because without equality, the society cannot survive. The society cannot grow. The society cannot grow the of existence. So you see, this, this verse number 12, it is because of this doubt that religion preaches equality, for equality may help the best to survive, some of the best may not be the fittest. Even the best may not be the fittest. That's what Baba Sambhika says, that the religion has to preach equality. And the religion that doesn't preach equality is of no use to the society. So you, 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 you guess it rightly, any religion that doesn't preach equality, that doesn't preach that the human beings are equal, you know, and you know, they, all of them should have been, should be given the equal opportunities. Uh, in, in, in the economic field, it's called level playing field. Everybody, you know, there has to be a field which should level the privileges so that people start from the same, uh, you know, the, uh, line. But we know that the people are not on the same line when they begin the race, they are at the different positions. So we have to create the level playing field. In the businesses, they do a lot of this. They create the level playing field for the different businesses so that they can all succeed in, in their businesses. It is because of this doubt that religion preaches equality for equality may help the best to survive you, even though the best may not be the fittest. And what society wants is the best and not the fittest. It is therefore, the primary reason why religion affords equality. This was the viewpoint of the Buddha and it was because of this that he argued that a religion which does not preach equality is not worth having. So any religion that, that doesn't preach equality is not worth having. Can you respect or believe in a religion which recommends actions that brings happiness to oneself by causing sorrow to others or happiness to others by causing sorrow to oneself or sorrow to both oneself and others? Is not that a better religion which promotes the happiness of others simultaneously with the happiness of oneself and tolerates no oppression? These were some of the most pertinent questions which he asked the Brahmins who opposed equality. The religion of the Buddha is perfect justice bringing 
from a man's own meritorious disposition. You see this uh, uh, subsection uh, covers a lot of grounds, a lot of vast ground and it covers a depth that has to be understood, that has to be reflected on from time to time. Particularly this particular uh, verse number 19, the religion of the Buddha is perfect justice. You see, who, you know, there are now scholars who are arguing as to how, how Baba Sambedkar philosophized the, the Buddha's Dhamma in a way that will be appreciated by the modern people. And there is a theme of justice, which is going on everywhere, you know, what about justice, what about justice? And it has become the part of the political revolutions everywhere in terms of, you know, people are fighting for justice. And verse number 19, as we see, Baba Sahib says that the religion of the Buddha is perfect justice. What a beautiful sentence. Even if even if we if, if we if we if we put a full stop after this, the religion of the Buddha is perfect justice. The Dhamma is perfect justice. It needs a lot of deep thinking, it needs a lot of understanding because you know Baba Sambedkar has come to a conclusion where he has he has made this very beautiful statement where he is claiming that the religion of the Buddha is perfect justice. It's up to us to understand this sentence very deeply as to what Baba Sambedkar meant when he wrote this particular sentence in the Buddha and his Dhamma, the religion of the Buddha is perfect justice, springing from a man's own meritorious disposition. You see, the idea of merit and this, this merit here is the generosity of the heart, is the ability to do good to the world. Is, 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 is the attitude that one develops or cultivates to be useful to the other people, to be serviceable to the other human being. This attitude of compassion, this attitude of metta, this attitude, as Baba Sambedkar said, respect and reverence for a fellow human being. This is where the justice comes from. You know this. This is so profound. You know it can. It can. If we. If we. If we. If we. If we come to this sentence, after you know reading a lot of books on justice and political philosophy, this this sentence strikes you so so uh, deeply that you know you begin to think of it very 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 deeply in your life. It, it can. It can. It should become the part of our meditation. The religion of the Buddha is perfect justice, springing from a man's own meritorious disposition. So what is the source of, of, of justice? Where lies the source of justice? From where does the, 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 the perfect justice springs from? It doesn't spring from the God. People say that there will be a judgment day in the, in the, in the, in the theistic religion like, 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 uh, like Christianity or Judaism or Islam. They have a concept of the judgment day that the God will judge, you know, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a concept of justice in those religions. But what about Buddhism? You know, there is no judge who is hovering over us. There is no judgment over us. Only thing that can judge us is our own meritorious disposition. And this is what the Buddha Dhamma is all about, you know, the, to cultivate the meritorious disposition, to cultivate certain qualities of mind to cultivate certain 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 uh, mental states to cultivate mindfulness to cultivate metta to cultivate vigor and energy to cultivate samaditi to cultivate all these wings of noble at full path isn't it and from that springs the perfect justice and uh, uh, we, we, we have seen a lot of talks about the Indian tricolor. Actually, it's four color. And uh, there is in the middle of it, there is a Ashokan wheel. This is the wheel of the Dhamma. The, the example, the symbol of perfect justice. And traditionally, the, the wheel of the Dhamma is interpreted in terms of how we can cultivate the samaditi or why, how we can cultivate the right vision. And this 
very idea of perfect justice. In theory, in, in, in writing, it's written in the Constitution of India. But to really, really, really make it happen, it's very important to cultivate the meritorious dispositions. And the more and more people cultivate the meritorious disposition, the more justice will spring up. Without this, it will be very impossible to create the just society. And, and I, think, I think this verse number 19 is, is the apex of what we have been discussing so far. And the meritorious disposition includes the quality of compassion, the quality of, of metta, the quality of, 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 of equality, the quality of, of, of fraternity, the quality of liberty, because this is what constitute the concept or the practice of justice. So I think uh, this particular two uh, subsections are so important for all of us to reflect on, to think about, to cogitate upon, to analyze, and to really make sense of for ourselves. And, and I, 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 I hope that we will we'll keep on coming back to these sections to know more about them, to have more clarity about it all the time. Like, like you know, this verse number 19 is so profound. The verse number 19 can go very deep in the exploration of the concept of the perfect justice. So uh, with this, today we complete the book number three of the Buddha and his Dhamma, and we have covered a lot of ground so far. And from the next week onwards, we are going to begin the book number four, Religion and Dhamma, which is another very interesting book. And we will see the space, pace. we will determine the pace as to how we are going to go about studying uh, this particular book number four. So before we conclude today, any comments or any, any reflections of anybody on the, on the class today? Jabim doctor. Jabim, Jabim. I have one reflection on that, uh, that the matter, the first chapter, that uh, uh, outcast uh, mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. Means uh, for for showing uh, this inequality, mm. they have put into practice in their daily life to show inequality. Mm -hmm. And what we are lacking uh, means uh, to, uh, to take a, a, a ahead of them to show equality in our daily life. I and mean, we have to make it in practice, mm -hmm. that equality. Mm -hmm. that, that gives the uh, broader reflection, I hope, uh, in the uh, society and mindsets. Mm -hmm. True. Means they have covered, covered themselves uh, uh, in a shield and... Uh, 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 with their myths uh, and their blindfoldness uh, regarding the superiority they are having. Mm -hmm. Outside that shield, it's all inequality is there and all inferior things are there. Mm -hmm. And to bro break this shell uh, for the society, mm -hmm. that we have to hammer it with the uh, uh, hammer of equality uh, to propagate mm -hmm. and practice in our daily life uh, and show how equal we are, all mm. human beings. And uh, whatever the uh, 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 things uh, I've mentioned in chapter th number three mm. regarding equality between man and man, mm. uh, it's, a, it's a only a mindset that has been characterized as inequality. It means mindset in the sense he is intelligent or less intelligent or more intelligent. Or, mm. Uh, but uh, uh, as a physically and for the uh, all the natural things available, mm -hmm. all are having equal rights and uh, uh, should be treated equally. Mm -hmm. So, beautiful reflection, Umesh. Anyone? Buddha, uh, Buddha was the upholder of equality. So all human, human beings are equal, irrespective of caste, breed, birth, and status. So if the 
equality is needed for this um, for, uh, the struggle to appear, come in the uh, flow, the struggle of our existence. If there is inequality, then the um, person with uh, having uh, uh, who is rich and everything is available will be considered sweetest. And then the uh, weak persons uh, will be uh, will not be uh, given chance mm -hmm. to develop. So there should be equality. Mm -hmm. See, this uh, subsection uh, three is very important. You know, this is 19 verses. And these are like axiomatic, like mathematical things, like mm -hmm. the very first postulate, men are born unequal. And yes. men are born equal, unequal means every human being is different from other human beings. No two human beings can be same. Yes. It's not possible to have the same human being with the same characteristics, with the same family circumstances. It's not possible because we are born unequal. So this word unequal is used in that sense, not in a sense yeah. of discriminatory uh, yeah. uh, sense. Yeah. In strength a, and way to do that they are poor or rich. Yes. Yeah. In this okay. manner, they are constrained. Hmm. So what the, the point is, if you know, if, if 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 we treat other people like each of them as 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 uh, as an unit, unique unit, we cannot have what is called the the community. So what we need to develop a community is the principle of equality, because without the principle of equality, there cannot be a society. Hmm. And we cannot live without a society because human beings by nature are social beings. We are not atomized individuals. We cannot be separated into different parcels from the other human beings. We are part and parcel of the society. So the beauty of this, this, this subsection three lies in, in very beautifully, uh, you know, uh, logically explaining the concept of equality and uh, there has to be a concept of equality in the society as a rule of life. Nobody should be treated lower or higher than other human beings. Baba Sambedkar is not saying that some people are higher or lower. What Baba Sambedkar is saying that people are not the same. They are different. Even, mm -hmm. even among the one class of people, say for example, the so-called Buddhist communities, no two human beings can be same. Not possible. In other words, every human being is a unique human being. Yeah, it's a concept of similar to ex existentialism. Hmm. The principles of existentialism is a similar kind of the philosophies has been developed over on, on Buddha's thought only, I hope. Good. The society doesn't need a fit person. What society needs is a best person. Because in the world, what we have seen, the world has gradually come to a stage, you know, because of the best people, because of the good people. So fit doesn't mean that, you know, they will, they are the best for the society. What we need is the best for the society. So I think, and then, Bab, then Baba Sambhika goes into the discussion and he, he ends up with this uh, three uh, gathas, uh, verses like 16, 17, 18, they are very profound. You see, can you respect or believe in a religion? This is a question for each of us. Can you respect or believe in a religion which recommends actions that bring happiness to oneself by causing sorrow to others? So what is your answer to that? The question that Baba Sambedkar raised here is, can you respect or believe in a religion which recommends actions that bring happiness to oneself by causing sorrows to others. Huh? Can you respect that religion? No, not at all. Okay. Can no. you respect or believe in a religion which recommends action that brings happiness huh, to others by causing sorrow to oneself or sorrow to one sorrow to both oneself and others? No. No. Is not that a better religion which promotes the happiness of others simultaneously with happiness of oneself and tolerates no oppression? Yes. Is it not better? Much better. Better. Isn't it? Yes. So these are, these were some of the most pertinent questions which he asked 
the brahmins who opposed equality and then the apex of the 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 the, the, the uh, section the religion of the buddha is perfect justice springing from a man's own meritorious disposition so you know coming back to the question of equality and inequality we can see that you know the buddha has a very conclusive answer to the question baba sambedkar has a very definite uh, view or definite understanding of 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 equality and the equality comes from uh, uh, you know looking at other human beings just we will be looking at ourselves and that has been the heart of buddhism and now when we are going to study the, in the in the next chapters bawa sambedkar goes much deeper into this discussion as to you know the relationship between man and man and the other religions like preach that there is a relationship between man and god and the god mediates a relationship between the two human beings and uh, this is how baba sambedkar you know goes on explaining the buddha's teachings of equality more deeper and deeper so any any further things so in the person last person with, with morality yeah. who follows panchashil and having compassion fraternity then that person can only give justice hmm. to the needy poor people or victim of the oppression and thus the uh, and he will be um, upholder of liberty equality fraternity that, that, that is taught by buddha you see uh, sila if we say sila is perfect justice hmm. and uh, sometimes we 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 glorify silas sometimes we claim that we are superior to other people because we practice sila because hmm. we we don't do what they what they do and sometimes sila becomes like very personalized things but in mm-hmm. in the scheme of baba sambedkar sila is the way or is the perfect justice so we we practice sila for what to ensure that there is justice in the world so mm-hmm. it is not just about uh, uh, having this uh, uh, what is called uh, that me being you know uh, uh, you know being superior to others in terms of because i practice sila why mm-hmm. i am taking this into discussion is this that the silas are 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 made to feel like uh, you know the like it pertains to individual of course the individual has to practice it but the context is the justice mm-hmm. the context is not to not to earn name and fame because one is practicing sila because one is one feels that they are better than others because they practice sila because that has been a trend now going on uh, everywhere that people have been claiming that you know they other people are not not good other people are bad i am best uh, because i practice sila so what i'm trying to get it at is you know if you look at the sila from the context of the perfect justice then it makes a very beautiful sense then the sila becomes the the practice of sila becomes the practice of justice itself mm-hmm. it is not that a person who practices sila can give justice because we cannot give justice isn't it the very practice of sila in terms of practicing equality in in terms of practicing practicing um, fraternity is the very heart of 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 bringing the perfect justice in the world so alka madam you are right but you know like like now there has been a trend in this in the in our societies or communities that people have been making the sila as some kind of the individual ornamentation you know and, and as a tool to bash other people yes yeah. Isn't it? We we should never do that. Ego, ego, and people claim that you know they 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 are not good. They are not perfect Buddhists. They are not perfect Ambedkar. Mm-hmm. Right? They don't understand the context of the sealer is not not mm-hmm. just to prove that I am I am I am a better Buddhist than you, or I am mm-hmm. I am I am I am I am I am better than you. The purpose of the sealer is to practice the perfect justice. Mm-hmm. This should be useful to the humanity. I think this this set sentence is very profound. any 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 comments by anybody i think sir the, the word justice uh, that we, we we are getting is uh, not meant for like this that the i don't eat lion it doesn't mean that lion will not eat us means it's it's a totally uh, entirely different and uh, regarding the last uh, uh, 19th verse regarding the springing out uh, on Uh, meritorious dispositions mm-hmm. man's own meritorious dispositions 
to to springing out all these own meritorious uh, 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 this uh, dispositions one have to fill it uh, within uh, himself first then it will spring out when the, somebody will be there to make that merit order uh, that these these principles that we have to go for perfect sir any 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 comment from by, by our uh, uh, academician vidyanand bhai or by shashank or rahul samiksha arvind ji vaishali tai rahul nitin sunil bhav now this is very uh, profound uh, the way baba saheb ambedkar had quoted the conception of merit he actually related that with uh, the moral code of society and how justice can be uh, he just not merely emphasizes the equality component Mm-hmm. but equality with equity which is mad, uh, which is matter and which can only give uh, justice and create a society which is healthy and harmonious to live for all mm-hmm. and that's how he uh, the one the person who is capable to do that is a meritorious person that's how he defined the merit it's very different from the definition of merit what usually been uh, stereotypes in uh, it's either uh, either defines based on your intellectual ability or based on because or based on your skill sets what you acquired throughout the life and how uh, efficiently you can perform mm-hmm. and that definition has a one fundamental flaw because it uh, that definition do not uh, incorporate it, it mm. although it incorporate in individual uh, individual uh, excellence but it does not uh, take into account the social excellence hmm. ambedkar's definitions uh, of merit the Bud- the way he uh, cited buddha is uh, partly different from it hmm. and very well uh, quoted put by baba sir very good. <clears throat> hello yes yeah yeah this <clears throat> the definition as quoted by dr baba sambedkar is very comprehensive because intelligence is not merely the because it's it's not going to be useful to the society not necessarily an intelligent or meritorious person can be a rock person if doesn't have a good character and a lot of discussion was going on on equality as uh, you was already pointed out no two human beings are equal it's true what is important is that uh, in society everybody must get an equal opportunity that is the concept also incorporated in our constitution mm. and creating a society based on the equality fraternity because all this has to be uh, equality and fraternity and justice all these are interrelated one mm. you cannot separate one from the other and that is why these principles have been balanced in our constitution we discuss a lot of uh, things regarding the justice social justice and, but it was not so easy when baba sir framed the constitution he had so many aspects in his mind and uh, uh, that's how mm. in fact our constitution is a reflection of the buddhist principles mm. so most of it is there uh, and uh, regarding one more point mm. uh, regarding equality we think that uh, we regard other persons as equal but we should also develop this habit of uh, equality we take it for granted way that we treat others equal hmm. but uh, in fact uh, many times we don't uh, treat other people equal that concept we have to develop ourselves hmm. of course the society has to develop but we have to develop ourselves within ourselves this uh, concept Mm. Beautifully said, sir. Very beautifully said. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, then we are approaching the end. Of the I part. have a last point. Yes, with the, the way uh, Baba Sir has quoted uh, the uh, definition, coined the definition of merit. Hmm. Often Plato is being cited uh, for uh, the uh, because cited is for a way. to philosophize in the way uh, what people achieve throughout the life and that way people define a merit hmm. 
so that has a uh, different connotations the the your individual merit or uh, the way you are performing and your leadership capacity can be because of your endowment effect can be because of the way you got uh, the, uh, uh, you you got trained in particular subject or uh, you uh, you receive that inputs in uh, in different parts of your uh, lifespan mm -hmm. and uh, it has different uh, factors uh, going through it and uh, through that uh, many people do cite plato wrongly in fact baba saheb ambedkar uh, is platonic in, in that sense and he uh, very correctly understood plato because if i go back to my reading even i was of under the impression that plato somewhere uh, 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 is uh, is uh, correlated to the uh, the brahmanic propagation of uh, merit but that's that's a, uh, that's a wrong in fact while uh, going through this session mm -hmm. i realized the uh, the very idea of plato also mm -hmm. and ambedkar and that says I mean, uh, uh, even because ambedkar has read all these philosophers so he has very uh, careful reading of uh, even philosophy uh, these philosopher as well as buddha and he cited very correctly he brought in the very correct interpretation of what these people are trying to say all right then if there is nothing to add we will end our class today and thank you so much for joining in next week we are going to begin the book number 4 and this another interesting book as we know that there are eight books in the buddhism and we have finished three books so it's time to celebrate and trying to uh, you know time to rejoice in 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 all the efforts that we all have put in together Thank you so much Jai Bhim Namo Bhagwan